Okay. So, uh, welcome everybody for uh, this uh, our webinar after a long break. We have our webinar today on surveillance of vector bond diseases, exploring the new horizons. And I'm very thankful to our two uh, uh, speakers, Dr. Pragya Yadav, who's uh, coming from uh, NIB Pune, one of the top institutions uh, uh, which uh, have done such a great job during the pandemic and uh, quality uh, virology lab. And we also have Dr. Ashwini Kumar, who's director of the Vector Control Research Center in uh, Pondicherry. Um, and the ICMR is a very important institution. And uh, uh, as now we understand more about vectors and their connection to disease uh, is a very crucial place. And uh, we are, I'm thankful to uh, both of them for accepting uh, uh, to be part of this webinar. And that actually brings the uh, 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 really a quality one would dream to have in, a webinar, uh, in, in webinars like this. Uh, so uh, thank you both uh, experts, uh, Dr. Pragya Yadav and uh, Dr. Ashwini Kumar. Uh, just to a uh, uh, couple of minutes, I would like to uh, mention uh, uh, the uh, why we are interested in this as an institution and uh, also the uh, uh, put in perspective uh, of, the, uh, of the webinar. We have uh, seen during this pandemic uh, and even from before, that uh, a disease once beyond certain level can really disrupt human life and even can change the course of civilization. So it's so important that uh, uh, then whether one is developed nation or one is developing nation or poor nation, all those things are, are, are gone and it becomes really a problem of humanity. And in the current scenario, we are just recovering from a pandemic. Uh, we are seeing the uh, uh, the uh, the really uh, great changes that are happening, uh, particularly in terms of uh, climate change and global warming, which is changing the landscape for the insects and many other uh, 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 life forms. And this brings uh, in a new perspective, the, uh, the disease that travel through vectors. And there are so many diseases that uh, for animals and for plants and humans, uh, all they are carried from one place to other uh, as a mode of transport by the pathogens uh, uh, using the insects, uh, largely used as a vectors. So that has brought a new perspective and new uh, things to worry about, which is unprecedented because the, those kinds of uh, global changes were not there before. The other thing that brings uh, uh, infectious disease in a special uh, context is that the mobility of uh, people has increased so much and the unfortunate thing of uh, uh, pushing, uh, uh, putting pressure on the wildlife and uh, 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 indiscriminate use of even uh, uh, um, other agriculture or uh, uh, cattle farming that we do and insects uh, become a key uh, factors in in that because the when the population density is more uh, uh, the the disease uh, context changes uh, so these are really something which uh, are uh, bringing in new changes new threats to us and of course once in a while new uh, i mean pathogens evolved and we have zoonotic spillage of uh, some pathogens to humans or to animals and one uh, just form of pandemic we have just seen. While that is the 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 grim part of the problem, but at the same time we have also learned in the last pandemic that how now the new technology, new science can help us go into such a fine details of how a virus is evolving, how a virus is spreading. We can even uh, from the environmental sampling we can tell the pathogen load of the entire city by just uh, a small test of uh, uh, environmental surveillance, which can be air or uh, wastewater or soil or, or uh, waste uh, system from uh, uh, poultry or hospitals or in different settings we can use. So these are now, and these are uh, good thing is that they're very sensitive, very reliable, and 
uh, very affordable technologies. It's not that it costs very, and they don't require too much of infrastructure. That's the beauty of biology that you can do everything in room temperature in a small place. So, uh, so while there is a big challenge, now we have new uh, possibilities of understanding the disease in a in a unprecedented details and even the dynamics of the disease in very detailed manner, which we have learned a lot. Uh, when we were doing surveillance of the COVID. For instance, uh, in Bangalore city, uh, for now a couple of years, we have been doing wastewater surveillance and we can tell in each uh, uh, zone in the city, 28 uh, uh, STPs that we use from each, each uh, STP catchment, we can tell how many people are having uh, COVID infection. And we, we just recently saw the silent wave pass through because the virus is not anymore. Uh, a clinical uh, uh, threat of the kind it was there before because of vaccine and other uh, uh, advantages that we have now. But we can know the load of the virus in each uh, uh, part of the city. Similarly, this can be extended to other pathogens and we have already begun doing that in, in at the consortium of large number of labs in the country. Uh, so uh, this means that now we have new ways of knowing the disease uh, spread even in the parts of the cities uh, without even uh, taking sample from any individual, just from the environmental sample. And this also brings us into the, uh, uh, brings to us the, the context of vector surveillance. Because the vectors, if we know which uh, mosquito species, what kind is uh, 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 available in which part, uh, prevent, uh, present in which part, whether we can the adult mosquitoes or we can, uh, do survey on the larvae uh, on their uh, breeding places, uh, water puddles, and so on. So we can, following these uh, approaches of uh, sampling and then applying the, the new sophisticated sensitive molecular biology methods and uh, to detect them, identify them, and even to go to genomic uh, level of surveillance and identify the, the variants or strains of those. So we can actually understand in very sophisticated level, uh, the, the dynamics of the pathogen in the context of the vector. So since all this is a possible problem is there, so we thought it's the right time to have uh, experts uh, explain to us uh, in their domain of uh, activity and research and, uh, and, uh, and uh, help us understand the problem and benefit the audience so that these things can be uh, popularized uh, among the relevant stockholders and also implemented because uh, knowing the danger where it is present helps us in avoiding the danger or taking care of that rather than reacting to it. So that's where surveillance becomes very uh, uh, advantageous thing uh, to have in our uh, healthcare system. And I'm uh, very happy and thankful to both uh, uh, Dr. Pagyayado and uh, Dr. Ashwini Kumar, they represent expertise and uh, 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 of very special kind, uh, which is very relevant to today's webinar. So after this, I hand over to Manasi to introduce uh, formally uh, our today's speakers and uh, uh, take this uh, webinar further. So thank you again, both of you for joining. Manasi, you can uh, proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Rakesh. Uh... So we will begin with the first uh, uh, talk uh, for the webinar by Dr. Pragya Yadav. So introducing her, Dr. Pragya Yadav is a senior scientist and head of the biosafety level four laboratory of the ICMR NIV Pune. She has been actively involved in diagnostic support and development of point of care assays in the COVID pandemic. She has to her credit, a discovery of many novel viruses in such as Nipah, Zika, Crimean Congo, hemor hemorrhagic fever, KFD and monkeypox virus outbreaks in the country. Uh, she has discovered many viral etiological agents, uh, as well as uh, she uh, she has uh, she has been the person for development of many cost-effective point-of-care diagnostic assays, which are now uh, commercialized as well. Her work contributed significantly to the beginning of research uh, of these highly viral, uh, highly infectious viral pathogens. And uh, she is uh, she is uh, one of the one of the uh, leading uh, people uh, uh, in in bio risk management and you know 
she has also assisted in evaluation and validation of BSL three laboratories in not only in India but also in, in Nepal and Bhutan. Um, additionally, she is a recipient of many prestigious awards. Amongst them, a few are Bharat uh, Bhagya Vidata Samman of 2022, conferred upon to her by the Ministry of Culture, Government of India, and many ICMR awards like Major General Sahib Singh Sokhi Award, uh, Dr. T. Ramachandra Award, Dr. Pranna Chutani Oration Award, NAMS Amritsar Award, and many and many of these. She's a fellow of the National Academy of Agricultural Sciences and member of many national and international committees, including ICMR, WHO, CEPI, Wellcome Trust, DBT. She has published around 300 research papers in various national and international journals. It's an honor to have her to talk about uh, her surveillance program in the, CC, uh, in the CCHF area, which is a tick bone virus. Uh, thank you, ma'am, and uh, I would hand over it to you. A, a, a small uh, request to the participants and the audience is uh, please put in your questions in the chat box in the Q&A section. Our speakers will try and answer them as and when uh, they, they, they find time uh, along the time of this webinar. Over to you, Dr. Pragya. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mansi. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh, sir, for in invitation and having me today in this very important webinar. So um, as we are talking about um, uh, CCHF, so a small introduction on the disease and what is the status in our country about this disease. As we all know that Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever is a tick-borne disease and uh, it is considered to be uh, one of the high priority disease by WHO. In 2019, there was a list made by WHO which is being updated further. And out of those uh, nine uh, uh, diseases, uh, four are present in India and CCHF is one of them, uh, along with the COVID, uh, uh, NIFA and also Jika. There are other diseases which is not uh, present. Uh, we don't have proof with us, uh, but they are always threat for India. With this, uh, everybody uh, uh, after the COVID-19 pandemic talk about uh, the pandemic preparedness. So uh, in all aspects, CCH have become a very important uh, disease uh, for the preparedness point of view. In 2019, there was a draft released by WHO on research and development R&D roadmap, and that included uh, five main goals, uh, in, including the improving diagnostic, therapeutics, vaccines, and also the vector control. And I'm very sure Dr. Ashwini Kumar sir will talk on um, more on the vector. Uh, if we talk about any high risk group of pathogens, including NIFA or CCHF, or we have seen uh, the whole uh, last uh, three and a half year, how uh, we were struggling to deal with COVID, which can have a uh, brutality and also the transmission of human to human. It, in, it actually uh, give, uh, lot of thinking and opportunity how we can improve uh, the responses and that is why the pandemic preparedness is talked much uh, after the uh, covid pandemic so whenever there is a high risk group pathogen uh, the first and most important event would be detecting such cases clinically uh, testing and confirming and as soon as we can isolate the case uh, we can start the containment and we can save many more life uh, uh, which we have seen in, in COVID also how we can cut down the chain of transmission and that can save a lot of work in, in the community. So in the process of these preparedness, anticipations, preventions, preparing, detecting, responding, and controlling a disease outbreaks for minimizing heal and economic effect. So these are the different steps which everybody talk. Being India as a, such a large country, one fifth of the population of the world, uh, till 2005, we didn't have a biocontainment facility to, uh, to work on high-risk group of pathogens. ICMR started this initiative and we had the first BSL-3 facility in 2005, but it started and become functional and uh, responded to many medical emergencies. Uh, for example, Zika, Ebola, NIFA, CCHF, and in the COVID, it, done, it did a lot of work. Uh, BSL-3 facility was enough for BSL-3 pathogen. Uh, as per the risk, uh, but what about the pathogen who are having BSL-4 uh, risk pathogen? And uh, they are those pathogen for them, there is no drug, medicines are uh, vaccine available. And if you want to do a vaccine trial, if you want to do preclinical studies, so you need to have uh, such kind of state of art where you can 
uh, do experiments uh, to saving the human lives. So in this line, uh, there was a, a new facility developed in, uh, in an IV campus uh, a BSL-4 facility, which become functional in 2013, and it responded uh, many of the medical uh, uh, emergency in, in the recent past. If we talk about Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, it was discovered way back in 70s. Uh, and uh, if you look at the old literature, it is labeled differently, but the, as per the latest ICDB classification, it fall under order uh, Bunia virus, family narrow viridi genus artho, artho narrow viruses. And it ha this has two uh, genogroups, uh, the one called CCHF0 group, which contain CCHF, Hazara virus, and Kassan virus. And the second uh, group is Narobi sheep disease virus, uh, and that include Narobi sheep disease, Ganjam virus, Dugby virus, and Pupe virus. Among Narobi sheep disease, we have the Ganjam virus, which is a very close cousin of Narobi sheep disease and uh, also cause uh, mortality in sheep and goat. So uh, as I mentioned, that CCHF is a risk group uh, four category pathogen, which is also called category A as per the classification. And uh, the beautiful uh, structure of this virus has a, a tripartite RNA genomes. They're called small, medium, and large, and they are uh, they are encoded for the small is for nucleocapsid, medium for glycoprotein, and large is for the RNA polymerase. So these three RNA stay uh, as and they uh, together uh, become the virus. The beautiful part of this virus that uh, the five and three terminals of all three RNA uh, are having this very homologous kind of nucleotide. So if you have designed a primer for the five and three end, you can am able to amplify S, M, and, and together in single tube. So the, uh, this is about uh, the CCHF. Because of having uh, having uh, uh, these uh, tripartite segments, as we know about uh, influenza virus, that they can have a reassortment. In the CCHF also many times the reassortment can happen and you can have, uh, if in the same host, different ticks are there, they're infected and uh, the, the virus replication is happening. There is a tendency that you can have different kind of lineages of CCHF virus present in the country. When we talk about the replication, as we all know that this is belong to Bunya viruses and it has the similar kind of pathway for entry and infusion. Uh, the virus replication happen in self uh, cytoplasm and the three ribonucleoprotein segment with RDRP attached acquire their viral glycoprotein rich envelope by budding into Golgi lumens. And then uh, they transfer to cell membrane and release uh, uh, by exocyte. Ex cytosis. Uh, so this is uh, kind of about the virus. If we talk about the burden of CCHF, so it is widely present across the world in Asia, Africa, Europe. And if we see the map of India, all the adjoining country attached to India having a CCHF prevalence, including Pakistan, Afghanistan, China, and Oman, uh, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and we do not know how or long must be present in India because there is no past data. But there are some zero studies which has shown that the CCHF was much earlier present than when we detected in 2011. So uh, that goes a history because we have a long back trade and uh, tourism of with these many adjoining countries. And uh, uh, we have uh, the same kind of animals, transportation, uh, and uh, the ticks are widely present. So there is no reason to believe and the virus was not present in the past in India. It also affected in Africa and Europe, uh, but at the same time, we have to understand that how much the surveillance is, in, uh, is improved, you can see more of the presence of the diseases. If we talk about the phylogenetic of this uh, virus, so it has uh, uh, completely seven uh, phylogenetic lineages. Uh, most of the Indian sequences fall into a clad, uh, in the Asian clad, which is six and seven, uh, clad, which you can see at the bottom of the tree, uh, but we have also seen some of the reassortment, which I will uh, describe you later. The transmission cycle of CCHF, uh, uh, so human is a kind of uh, accidental host and uh, they get infection by tick bite or also nosocomial human to human transmission and the ticks harbor the virus and uh, when they stay on the animals. 
they keep uh, feeding, uh, but uh, there, is, there is no disease uh, happen to the animals and they have, they have a very transient uh, viremia, but they have a long life presence of the antibodies. Uh, if you see in any area where the ticks are infested on these animals, the number will be very high. And that is, a, that is the, one of the major factor uh, to control the disease if we can uh, remove these ticks and not allow to infest on the animals. So they, they can have the nosocomial horizontal transmission and also the vertical transmission from, uh, from eggs to larvae in nymph and adults. Uh, they can also infect the birds and small vertebrate and then these, if they are migratory birds, so there is a transmission capacity from one country or from one geography area to another area as well. And there are some reports which has uh, shown that birds can carry the infected ticks and then they can uh, go to other country and spread the disease. If we talk about the vectors, hyloma ticks are the mainly uh, vector species, which is a hard body ticks in, come under the family of size. And uh, there were there are at least 35 different tick species, including soft tick species uh, from the family Augustis. Uh, but mainly in India, we have Hyloma anotolicum, anotolicum that is a species which uh, is mainly in, infected with, uh, with the virus. Uh, also, uh, uh, they can uh, transidially uh, uh, infect and maintain the genotic cycle in the nature. When we call about the what will be the factor for the expansion and introduction to the new area, so uh, we have to remember that the how long tick has is attached to the animal host, uh, what level of infestations are occurring, then transportation of infected ticks on a uh, migratory bird, then uh, also the animal trade would be one of the reason how you can move the disease from one area to another and then importation of infected human being and are under incubation could also lead to a spread of the disease. The incubation period ranges from two to 14 days and 70% of this uh, CCHF cases have a history of tick bite. Uh, the case facility, fatality can range from 30 to 80% and sometime even 100%. The very common uh, clinical symptom would include fever, chills, uh, myalgia, headaches, sickness and vom uh, vomiting, abdominal pain, arthalgia, and which you can get confused with many other viral or uh, parasitic disease or even bacterial disease. So clinical diagnosis may not be a very right approach uh, to understand the cases uh, uh, with the symptomatic uh, presentation of the case. The first outbreak of uh, CCHF happened in 2011, which was confirmed. But prior to that, we were doing uh, under uh, we were doing a study with the CDC. Uh, it's called Global Disease Detection, and under that, we were screening uh, the livestock uh, from three states, including Maharashtra, Gujarat, and also the Northeast. And under that, we could see that there was a uh, IgG positivity uh, were found in 2010 in Rajasthan from Sirohi uh, district, and this was a just alarm and in, this was December 2010 when we found the antibody presence and then the first outbreak was confirmed in January 2011. Uh, this outbreak included, included a total five cases and out of that four uh, died and one could survive. Uh, in case of CCHF, the, those patients who get tick bite, uh, the viremia is very high in those patients. And most of the time, uh, before even any IgM antibodies develop, they die um, uh, prior to detection itself. So in this outbreak, which happened in Ahmedabad, uh, and the patients were uh, were admitted and they transferred to another hospital, that lead to uh, to the hospital bond infection, and the doctor and nurses also died along with the index case. Uh, that included death of three healthcare worker, and it was a huge uh, sensational. A uh, scary news at the moment, and uh, it, it it referred to NIV in probably thinking about the Huntan virus. And uh, we did a panel of different viral hemorrhagic fevers, which can cause mortality of such. And uh, after screening whole panel, we could confirm that CCHF was a uh, was the main uh, pathogen present in the samples, uh, confirmed by sequencing real time and also later on the virus isolation. So in such kind of L, as, uh, episode, when there is a suspected outbreak, uh, the first is like uh, doing the confirmation of outbreak and the, to prove the cause postulates, you have to do isolation of virus, confirm the genome, 
and and then then uh, the the uh, as soon as the outbreak is confirmed you you go for the containment uh, isolations and capacity building at the same time you have to protect the workforce so that they don't get infected in the process but cchf is a zoonotic disease it is not just a human but it involves animals and it also involves uh, the ticks so you have to work to understand that how much tick infestations are there if they are infected and you have to act uh, with the help of animal husbandry and other division of the state health uh, to act in such kind of outbreak. In this outbreak, we could uh, sequence uh, the positive cases and also the ticks which were collected from the index house and, and also in the village. And it could show that this virus was uh, 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 this virus was coming from Tajikistan way back 33 years at that moment. And uh, uh, we, could, uh, we could see that it was uh, falling in Asian a lineage, but it was a reassortment of Asian and Middle East strain of CCHF virus. Uh, we could uh, we immediately did a zero survey in uh, in Ahmedabad, and 21 percent animals were found positive for IgG. Uh, that actually gave a lesson that quick diagnosis is required to control such outbreak. Uh, we could do the isolation of the virus not only in the mouse but also in 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 virus uh, virus cells. And that was used further for developing different assays. Until 2011, there was no commercial ELISA kits for human animals available in the market. So it was primarily we were uh, we need to develop, and all the regions which we were using, uh, we we were receiving from uh, CDC. So uh, we immediate uh, we started working on developing different assays, and we could uh, develop uh, IFA. Uh, we could develop uh, IgG ELISA for animals that include cattle, sheep, and goat then IgG and IgM ELISA for human. Later on, these technologies uh, were transferred to Jidus Cadilla for uh, scale productions. After this outbreak, uh, there was a single uh, outbreak, a single case was detected in Ahmedabad in June 2012. And this was a single fatal case uh, of a healthcare worker when he was treating an index case who died, uh, and then he had a splash of blood in his eye. And uh, this was a very uh, unusual case. The incubation period was very low and, and it actually further enhanced uh, uh, the need of using PPE isolation practices in the hospital when they're handling uh, such the cases. In 2011, when the case was confirmed, we went uh, and we screened all the retrospective samples which we received in, in an IV for Hanchan virus diagnosis and there was one uh, case uh, found positive from PDU Gujarat of 2010, which means that CCHF must be present in Gujarat even prior to 2010. The most striking, the next outbreak happened in 2013 in Amdeli district in Karyana village, uh, which is, uh, if you, uh, it, 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 the cases happened between 23rd June to 25th July, uh, that is a mostly rainy season. And a cluster of suspected VHF cases were reported from one family uh, in district Amdeli. And, and initially two very aged people died and many people went to visit them and they also got infected. And the chain of uh, transmission established in, in five different districts in Gujarat from one single origin. Uh, main occupation was agriculture and animal husbandry. And there was high infestations of the ticks on cattle population of affected community uh, in that particular area. This, uh, uh, there were several cluster of cases happen who attended uh, death rituals and touched the body. And they were uh, after that, it was a big lesson that if there is a confirmed case, they should not be handed over to the cool kids, but it should be, uh, it, it should be uh, uh, taken care by health authority in a proper manner. And after that, uh, this kind of episode didn't happen in Gujarat, they followed very, meticulously, and if there is any death happen, uh, they take care of uh, such situation, as we have seen in, in Ebola and also in the COVID. So expert committee decided for enhancing the surveillance for CCHF in livestock, and uh, because uh, doing a tick surveillance would be very difficult, but uh, if we do the livestock uh, surveillance, then we can monitor uh, how much is spread or how much antibodies are present in which areas. So uh, th this was a study which we published that uh, time. Later on, we did a study first in Gujarat state that included 15 districts. We collected uh, around uh, 1,200 samples, and we found uh, that most of the district uh, animals were found positivity, 
in bovine it was 12 uh, percent positivity sheep and goat showed higher percent of positivity that was 41 percent and 32 percent and that actually give a very good indicator to understand if uh, the infected ticks are present in the area and they are biting to, to these animals and they are getting uh, antibody uh, uh, present in those bodies. So uh, then further, uh, that actually again gave a message that we should enhance the VHF surveillance in, uh, in this state. The next outbreak was recorded in March 2014, which was the Sirohi Rajasthan from where we got the first indication of uh, the zero positivity in animal. Uh, there was a 45 years male uh, presented with moderate fever, chills, and uh, has a uh, generalized body ache, constipations, and also bleeding from nose, hematuria, and bleeding per rectum. So this is a very typical symptom of viral hemorrhagic fever. And when the samples were referred, it was confirmed as a CCHF case. And uh, uh, the, the, the further when uh, the index case was followed, uh, there were uh, more cases were found uh, uh, positive in Rajasthan for IgM and IgG antibody as well. So this was also uh, further uh, looking at the positivity in in uh, in Gujarat state. We uh, de uh, decided to do a countrywide survey in livestock, and with the help of uh, FMD network, which is under the ICR. Uh, we could collect 5,636 samples from bovine sheep, goats, and which covered most of this uh, red and yellow area. The white areas are those who we did not get the samples. But if you look at all the screen areas, showed IgG uh, positivity at higher or lower level. So uh, it was 5.4 percent bovine and 10.59 percent sheep and goat. But some of the states showed even 50% positivity in these animals. So I'm telling you average positivity. And that actually uh, give kind of a, a highlight uh, that uh, these infected ticks must, must be present in, in different part of the country. Uh, and they, they, we have to uh, keep monitoring the hospitalized RBHF cases or uh, fever cases in the future. In 2015, when the Ebola outbreak was rising in, in uh, and it started spreading in three different countries, WHO de uh, declares it, it is an international emergency. The same time uh, in, from, uh, in, Maha in, in Gujarat and also in Rajasthan, there was a uh, BHF cases reported. They were sent to NIV, they were confirmed positive. And uh, before confirmation, there was a huge news across uh, media that it is an Ebola case has come to India and people are dying because there was death in case as well, healthcare worker was uh, uh, died due to the infection. Later on, uh, when other case history was taken, they were all linked from the one phase, and other uh, cases started from uh, from uh, from Rajasthan, and then uh, they uh, the case uh, is spread to Delhi, and then two cases went to Gujarat. So uh, they're the same. So one origin could lead to the cases in three different states. Uh, this it was sequenced and it found that it was not the virus strain which we found earlier. It was in Afghanistan strain, and all three uh, S, M, and L gene were having the similar kind of Afghanistan uh, lineages uh, present, and which again linked that all the cases were linked from one nosocomial outbreak and spread in the different. So further, uh, when uh, we went back and uh, in, uh, did the survey uh, in the index uh, persons, how uh, area in the village, uh, the, the high zero positivity and text positivity was also recorded uh, like earlier uh, in the other outbreak. Not only that, we also observe uh, the, uh, the CCHF patients infected from other country arriving in India. And because CCHF uh, alert was very high in, in Gujarat from 2011, so there was a one case which arrived in Kutch, Gujarat, and clinician couldn't uh, pick the case and referred as, and it was confirmed as CCH virus. It was sequenced. It was the Oman strain, uh, which we could isolate, we could sequence. And uh, it, uh, it actually, again, further alerted that IHR play a very important role uh, in the case of such high infectious diseases. And uh, these diseases has to be monitored. Uh, the sequence was done, and it was a recombinant strain of Asia and uh, also the Oman and Middle East, uh, uh, and it, we could sequence and we could see there was a reassortment of S, M, and L segments. So that was recorded. Further, uh, we decided to do a zero prevalence study in human to understand how much population or which risk uh, population is having high uh, prevalence for the CCHF. 
more than 5,000 samples were collected uh, from different uh, uh, risk population, including uh, the, the neighbor contacts, CCHF affected persons, house, uh, the close contact, uh, hospital contacts, animal handlers, abattoir workers, including farmers. And we could see that highly uh, antibodies uh, prevalence was found in uh, the, those people who were uh, index case, uh, very close contacts and also the neighbor, neighbor's contact, animal handlers. And uh, that they, these, uh, the positivity was recorded in different districts of uh, Gujarat, which further emphasized uh, that uh, the disease was uh, prevalent in Gujarat state uh, and uh, the data shown uh, very uh, influenced. Uh, the further, we could see another importations of CCHF from UAE to Kela in 2018. And uh, it was a clinical Yes, you have five four minutes. For okay, that. okay. Yeah. So, uh, so if we look at uh, the different cases from 2011 to 23, we could see uh, a huge number of deaths that include a high percent to importations. And uh, in 2019, there was a huge outbreak in Rajasthan and Gujarat that lead a 50 percent cases death. So, out of 40 cases, there were 20. We did a, a viral kinetics and see. The virus uh, RNA was present up to 70 days in few of the cases. Antibiotic, uh, antibody kinetics was done, and we could found that uh, antibody was present till five years. If we talk about uh, the phylogeography of this virus in India, we have three different strains, uh, the Tajikistan, Afghanistan, and then we also have the resorting strains. These informations are there, and based on that, uh, different guidelines were made and uh, the govern Gujarat government, Rajasthan government, and everybody follow those uh, government of India guidelines that include also defining the suspect case, probable case, confirmed case, and how to try out the cases, what should be category A, B, C. Uh, then uh, there is also, uh, we can identify the CCHF cases by uh, uh, their prognosis uh, using uh, different parameters. Uh, this is a disappointing to know that there is no clear cut antivirals or vaccines so far present for the for the CCHF. So only supportive therapy can help when a patient is detected and isolation can help in uh, cut down the transmission. If we talk about the preclinical study for any trial studies, uh, the newborn mice and red, uh, rats, knockout mouse and humanized mouse model, and also the non-human primate would be the right model. There are many vaccine candidates available and uh, that include inactivated vaccines, subunit vaccines, virus-like particles and virus replication particles, vector-based vaccine. And they are at very uh, are different phases of uh, development, but no, no vaccine is available uh, to be used uh, at the moment. Even some of the messenger RNA candidates are also in, in the preclinical phase. What I'm trying to say here that post-pandemic India has enhanced our capacity that include a larger uh, network of DHR, VRDL laboratory. We have more PSL3 laboratory, uh, NGS, uh, uh, NGS facilities has increased. We have a larger number of laboratory diagnostic capacity. And also we have come up with a mobile BSL3 facility which can be used in any uh, such kind of outbreak. One health center, is in, in process to develop and for new NIV-like structure is being developed. With this, we have now uh, developed 11 KFD laboratory network and CCHF though can detect uh, these two diseases and uh, this BSL-3 facility can be used in remote area for uh, outbreak investigation. When we talk about the geonetic disease, One Health is the key message that we have to work together and Gujarat and Rajasthan continuously has shown that uh, they work in harmony. That is why we are able to, uh, to work and gather data on the disease. We have to work more to have the therapeutics and also the vaccine. We have to build more capacity on, on, the, on, on the biosafety laboratory training competency. Uh, with the same time, we also need to determine the uh, package of supportive care for management and then identify the relevant uh, animal model for CCHF. India has a huge, a huge capacity for vaccine development, which we have uh, demonstrated during the pandemic. And we have many R&D capacity ex across the country. We have great uh, academic institution. And I, I think in future, we should have uh, a vaccine quickly available for the CCHF as well. With this, I thank all uh, different health authority across the country, including the Ministry of Health, uh, NCDC, 
and, and different partners from, uh, from different, uh, including VRDLs, uh, who work with us uh, and in different projects uh, to understand the CCHF. With this, I thank you uh, for patient listening. You're not, you're mute, Mansi. Yeah, thank you so much, ma'am. It was an amazing talk. We got to, I'm sure the audience and even us, we have enjoyed a lot hearing about CCHF and it was really, really a lot of work. Uh, we will have the questions uh, together with Dr. Ashwini Kumar's session and after his talk. So I will uh, now request uh, uh, Dr. Ashwini Kumar to uh, load his slides until I introduce him. Uh, so uh, 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 thank you, Dr. Ashwini Kumar, for accepting the um, invite to, uh, to talk. Uh, so Dr. Ashwini Kumar is the director of the Indian Council of Medical Research Vector Control Research Center, Puducherry. He's an adjunct professor at the Georgetown University, Washington, DC, USA. Dr. Kumar has more than 36 years of research experience in the field of vector bone diseases, and he has handled more than 100 national and international projects, covering both basic and applied aspects of vector bone diseases. Uh, he has served the ICMR and uh, ICMR and IMR Goa for 32 years before he moved to VCRC as a director. Uh, he has been instrumental in launching national MSc public health entomology course with five ICMR institutes participating for the national capacity building under, and under his leadership, the International Center of Excellence for Training in Entomology has been set up at VCRC for creating critical mass of entomologists for capacity building and strengthening uh, the country to tackle vector bone diseases. Dr. Kumar has published more than 170 articles and reviews in various journals. He has written and edited more than five books, and he uh, he is a leader in vector surveillance and controls. And he has uh, he has been really instrumental in uh, framing certain frameworks, and he's been a regional director. He's been also been a regional director and advisor of the WHO Southeast Asia region on various occasions. Currently, he's also an advisor in Research Triangle Inst at the Research Triangle Institute USA for the India office. So we are really honored to have you on board. And uh, we look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mansi, uh, for this uh, introduction of uh, your my my introduction by you. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Mishra, and the colleagues from Tix for inviting me to make a presentation on the new technologies for vector surveillance. And the topic that I have chosen is the use of drones in vector surveillance. What are the prospects of these drones and what are the limitations? So as we know that, uh, you know, traditionally the vector surveillance uh, was done uh, using hand catches. And then later on, several tools were developed for vector surveillance which included different kinds of traps for different types of vectors. And still uh, we are deploying those old tools uh, in uh, very many situations where still uh, the vector surveillance is undertaken in different uh, parts of the world, including in our own country. But you know, the new technologies backed by the AI and machine learning, they are now making an entry uh, into the vector space and vector for especially for vector surveillance and also for vector control. So therefore we need to you know understand these evolving technologies and also try to understand what are the prospects that they bring in and what are the inherent limitations they have at this point or point in time. Uh, sir, uh, so, you have, sir, you have 20 minutes. Uh, okay, okay, yes, I know. Uh, so the drones can be, as you know, they are deployed in for various, various, uh, you know, applications. May it be in defense, agriculture, in entertainment, you know, as you know, uh, during marriages nowadays, they're using extensively or parties, they use drone, drones. And for disaster management, actually, during fires or floods, uh, to understand the magnitude of problem and also in the healthcare for healthcare delivery. Uh, I will come on that and uh, transportation and I mean the deliveries are possible by uh, from from these go downs to the houses and pinpointed delivery of these items and also the control and coordination by the 
defense services or the law enforcing uh, services. And in the, in the healthcare sector, the delivery of uh, medicine, vaccines, and other medical and surgical essential items into remote areas or where they are needed can be very efficiently done rather than you know, by road, but by deploying the uh, uh, aerial vehicles like drones. And also currently the vector-borne diseases control and the vector surveillance is also uh, you know, trying to accommodate the use of these uh, aerial unmanned vehicles uh, in the vector control. Uh, so uh, this is just a, a glimpse of what ICMR has done. ICMR actually started a iDrone program during the pandemic. Actually, there was a need to transport vaccine to the far-flung areas or islands across the large water bodies in short period of time. And at that time, our leader, Dr. Balram Bhargava, and the other senior scientists conceived this program and they conceptualized, and then they uh, had, uh, you know, understanding with IIT Kanpur, which has its own runways to use these drones, and they have the aerospace and aeronautical division, and they had they have the expertise in assembling drones, and so this joint program took shape, and then uh, from August 21 to February 22, uh, 2022, in Manipur and Nagaland, several sorties of these uh, drones were made, which uh, delivered vaccines to the far-flung areas pinpointed. But this required a lot of testing uh, in IIT Kanpur prior to deployment of these vaccines because dummy vaccines were used for their stability, temperature tolerance, and all that. This is just a uh, just to give you a background. And now our current leadership, Dr. Um, Rajiv Bahal, has uh, also kick-started a program for blood bag transportation uh, uh, in, in our phase three program. And these are some of the areas where the drones were used in the Northeastern sector. And uh, for using these drones, we require a lot of uh, approvals, you know, and then of course there are conditions in which these uh, drones can operate. But uh, as far as the regulatory approvals are concerned, we need to have approvals from Director General of Civil Aviation, Ministry of Civil Avi Aviation, Ministry of Health, Family Welfare. And we have to involve se several stakeholders like state health department officials uh, to whom uh, we want to actually benefit with these drones. And Airport Authority of India, the state air traffic control, the ATC, and also technical experts that may be involved in this. And of course, there are several ethical considerations with the use of these uh, drones. And therefore, the institutional ethics committees come into picture. And uh, this is the phase three program of uh, the ICMR in which they are talking about the, the transportation of medical supplies in Kailong and Himachal Pradesh. And then also the blood bags, as I mentioned, they are now actually validating that in NCR Delhi and also the, the sputum samples and drug among the tribal and hilly areas of uh, Telangana. And uh, then finally, the, you know, the shifting of samples, onco-histopathological samples uh, to, uh, you know, from uh, remote areas to the Manipal in uh, Udupi district in Karnataka. And these are different centers, ICMR institutes, where the vector work actually uh, is undertaken. So uh, we have large presence of the ICMR institutions which undertake the vector-related work. So the application of these or testing or validation of aerial vehicles is really possible in different geographical and climatic conditions in the country. So the... Uh, uh, these these drones, as you know, can really uh, map areas of uh, the uh, geographical areas, the water inundated, inundated areas, uh, in trying to find out the potential breeding potential, particularly of of mosquitoes, uh, and also uh, possibly you know the land cover land use in case of kfd for example is very uh, very critical on the in the forest fringes and uh, several other conditions where the drones can be actually deployed 
in assessing the uh, in a in a very short time the potential breeding potential and of course uh, uh, there are there are there are there are several limitations under which these drones at the moment operate uh, however they can be used for mapping uh, and identification uh, and larval habitat detection population monitoring environmental monitoring and of course mounting rapid response and the surveillance and also, of course, the, we'll be talking about the, how to analyze the data that is uh, transmitted by these drones, and we'll talk about the limitations. So this is one example of mapping uh, and identifying uh, the areas where the, uh, the, the water inundates uh, over a vast swath of uh, agricultural fields uh, so uh, and 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 uh, these drones, you know, when their path is decided and uh, a GPS system is used, they exactly follow that path, and they can they can picture those areas with 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 uh, high highly sensitive uh, cameras, and then they can also transfer this uh, to the cloud, and the in the real time pictures can be can be shared with the with the command center. And uh, so uh, they can be used in uh, monitoring the sterile insect techniques, releases and capture larval habitats. And uh, they can also be deployed not only for surveillance, but also for application of larvicides, adulticides. And here are some of the examples of different kinds of drones that can be used for either surveillance, adulticides, or sterile insect techniques or the larvicide application. And on the left side, which you see the green spots, actually these are the spots identified by the UAV vehicle uh, in, by, by uh, doing GPS, GIS mapping, uh, identifying the breeding habitats. And the and and once the larval habitats are identified, which you which you can see in in the in the image here, uh, you can find that this is when you do the ground truth, you find indeed the center this 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 center part, and that really shows that uh, when the ground truth has done that, really there are areas which are inundated with water or they have water bodies. And uh, of course, uh, one can do uh, ground truth by ground surveillance of these vectors. The presence, mere presence of water, does not mean that there will be a breed. There will be breeding of mosquitoes, but that will indicate the potential and identify the areas which can be treated with the larvicides. Normally, the in the in the in the program setting, the it's not that one has to identify the only positive sites and treat selectively, but uh, the, the, or the the entire area which is inundated uh, has to be brought under surveillance because uh, some of the areas may have may have undetectable immatures, and they might have only eggs which will turn into larvae in, in short time. So the spraying can be done in wasp swaths. And uh, this is an example here of a uh, uh, heat map on the left side, lower side, which you can, which, which, which can be, when compared with the vegetation, here you can see the areas which are green, that they represent vegetation. And uh, the habitation can be seen in the gray areas. So these uh, pixelated pictures with the different uh, coloration can represent different, uh, uh, you know, kind of areas. For example, road can be represented by gray, and water bodies uh, uh, are represented uh, by by the by the blue areas. So uh, the uh, the drones can, with the high high precision cameras, they can not only be helpful in larval source management in controlling mosquito populations but also they can be used uh, for uh, you know, uh, mapping uh, using high resolution cameras, but also the application of larvae sites we can, we, or, or adult sites. We will show you some of the examples of that. And uh, it can be, drones can be used for population monitoring. For example, uh, the advantages with the drones is that, you know, they can have a resolution of uh, two centimeters as against the satellite 
uh, imageries of uh, 10 meter resolution or 30 meter, which are very, uh, very opaque. And then these are much better uh, to, to pinpoint the breeding habitats with the drones, with the high resolution cameras. And also we can find out the seasonal in the seasonality, we can monitor these water bodies. For example, uh, from June to August, you can see that uh, while in June, uh, there is larger, very large water body it has shrunk in July and finally in August almost dried up in this example. And uh, so similarly, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, MS bands, which represent these different water bodies, you know, the, the uh, colored areas can represent these uh, water bodies uh, and we can uh, uh, monitor the population of these uh, adults uh, emanating from these water bodies. Uh, this is one of the examples of environmental monitoring. Uh, the most striking uh, in, in this slide, which is very crowded, I would like to draw your attention into a picture which is showing before and after where you see uh, the, the vegetation which has been removed uh, and, and you, can, you can actually um, monitor the land use, land cover pattern, the deforestation and uh, uh, so, so these areas now once they are brought into agriculture, the potential of uh, vectors would increase in such areas and also the remote sensing technology has been used also to to, to pinpoint the, the uh, using heat maps, the reservoir, possible reservoir of infection, as you can see in the la lower uh, orange picture where a monkey uh, is uh, identified in the, in the forest. And uh, we have the example of Plasmodium nalsi, which is actually being transmitted from monkeys to humans in, in Malaysia and, uh, and, and causing a lot of deaths and that is due to removal of the natural forest and uh, and and also growing the palm palm uh, you know uh, farming doing the palm farming and that has resulted in huge so those conditions can be easily monitored by by the drones and the risk of infections or transmission can also be done uh, so environmental monitoring is very much possible with drones here are some of the examples uh, in our country in chennai Incidentally, uh, not only the drones are deployed by the Chennai Municipal, Greater Chennai uh, Municipal Corporation for uh, surveillance, but also some of the areas uh, are under spraying of larvae sites, uh, for example, Otari, Nala and other places where routinely the Greater Chennai Corporation is now deploying drones with their payloads uh, having uh, the insecticides and they are being sprayed in the grassy marshy lands and also the drains. Lower picture is of the use of drones uh, in Kolkata. Uh, here, uh, the intent is to identify the breeding sites of uh, dengue mosquitoes, it is Egypt eye, but uh, uh, we, we understand that these kind of uh, places, normally the Aedes aegypti does not breed. So uh, the drones can, can actually uh, do a composite surveillance for not only anophilines, adines, but also the culicines. So you can do a comprehensive surveillance for vectors of various vector-borne diseases and use that information very selectively. And uh, here is an example where a well has been identified uh, using uh, the drone drones and uh, and and of course you can also see what sort of structures are whether these are flat structures which can potentially store water during the monsoons or these are uh, sloping roofs which will not allow water to stagnate so so this uh, a bird eye view can also be taken about the habitation of a technology uh, of 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 any any geographical area or a city or part of city so uh, these are uh, the examples which I was uh, talking to you about the use of drones in, and here is the payload which is on the right side. The insecticide is being loaded to the drone for larviciding activity. And this uh, is the about the data analysis and integration. Here's an example where the these in, in sterile insect techniques, uh, red dot, which is in, in, in the left uh, upper picture, is the release point where the sterile uh, mosquitoes were released. 
And then the, uh, the BG sentinel traps were deployed in order to capture uh, these mosquitoes. And uh, the black areas are the ones, dots are the ones where the, these mosquitoes released here could be captured in order to understand the spread of these. And they, these were captured by the drones. The, the, and, and also the white ones, the areas are the ones which where these BG sentinel traps were negative. And uh, so the, this technology can be very, uh, can be fine tuned and used in even the uh, SIT technology. And uh, on the right side, this is a picture of uh, an area in Thailand where uh, the blue, uh, uh, you know, this uh, serpentine is uh, the, the line is, uh, is representing uh, a, a river. And two mosquitoes uh, are here, uh, you know, uh, they, they, were, they were captured on the, uh, on the ground, but they were compared with the, with the uh, colored picture, uh, which uh, here the black color represents the dense forest, the, the green, uh, uh, you know, area uh, represents the, the vegetation and uh, the uh, forest actually, the yellow uh, area represents the agricultural lands and uh, the pink areas represent the orchard. And of course, here in different proportion of these two mosquitoes were captured, the Anopheles barbirostris and Anopheles uh, subpictus sensulato. Both are vectors in this area. So uh, one can now correlate the kind of background vegetation with the type of species that is breeding in, in these areas, can breed in this area. And of course, accordingly, the the spray activity or the management can be organized. And this is another example uh, from India. This is a Mahsana district of uh, Gujarat. Uh, and and you, can, you can see here the tires uh, on the upper left picture on the rooftop. So this geographical reconnaissance can be done and various different uh, types of breeding sites that might be present on the rooftops can be identified. Here you can see two white uh, overhead tanks with the open lid, which will invite the vectors to breed and also the inundated area here with the waterlogged area, which can be identified. And similarly, you can see uh, on the lower side of the, of the picture that uh, uh, vector breeding can take place. So these, these uh, images can instantly be uh, transferred to the control authorities or the municipality or the health services and the action can actually begin. And monitoring these areas physically would be very challenging and very difficult. You have to climb up to these multi-storied buildings and then, then see while the drones provide you this opportunity to, to, uh, to visualize uh, in large areas what's happening in those and you can identify especially those buildings and GPS can uh, coordinates can inform you the location of exact location of these breeding sites on different types of buildings. That's the advantage with the drone technology. So there are, uh, uh, I will cut it short uh, due to time. So uh, there can be, uh, uh, the, there are several prospects of uh, using drones in the vector surveillance they actually provide us an opportunity to cover large area quickly and enable efficient surveillance uh, of vectors. And they can capture real-time data, transfer the data, and the, and, and the action can immediately follow. And also the, the areas which cannot be accessed due to uh, dense vegetation or during the disasters or during fi fires, the, uh, these uh, drones can be deployed in the challenging situations and then they can uh, provide uh, information uh, for the uh, vector control. Many, many uh, uh, inundated areas which uh, cannot be covered um, um, you know, uh, by, by humans uh, physically, and that information can also be retrieved by the drones and the uh, vector 
control can follow. And uh, so rapid mapping is possible with these. And uh, as I said, early detection and response can be mounted. As far as the costs are concerned, uh, we need to really work on these are early days of using uh, drones. And we do not have uh, any much studies, many studies or even few studies uh, to let us know that the, there's a cost comparison between the routine surveillance and the use of by use of these drones. But definitely these are very efficient and maybe is expected to be cost effective. There are several limitations at this moment uh, uh, in the use of drones. Uh, because they have uh, limited payload capacity and, uh, and, and therefore they can only cover a limited area as far as uh, their reach is concerned. And similarly, they can only spray limited areas and they have to uh, come back to the loading station again and, and, and go back to those areas uh, to spray again. And therefore, that could be, could be a challenge and impediment. And in certain weather conditions, when it's really overcast or raining heavily or there are strong winds or snowing, uh, then it's very difficult to maneuver these, these drones. And that could be a real limitation in those abnormal conditions of weather conditions. Then there are technical challenges here. It's a highly sophisticated, you require skilled manpower. And uh, you need an understanding. And um, those who are pilots of these drones, they need to understand the needs of the, the, uh, the entomologists and the vector control persons. And therefore, they have to direct the drones in, in a manner in which the best possible data can be retrieved that is needed for action by the public health uh, experts. And uh, also there are uh, issues regarding privacy and the ethical considerations. These drones have cameras and, uh, you know, as you know, and the high resolution camera, and they can intrude easily privacy of people and uh, therefore can cause a great deal of concern. And they can also, you know, uh, survey the properties of people and people can be very sensitive about it. And therefore, uh, a public interface prior to deployment of these drones is, is a major consideration here. And there are, of course, strong regulations of using drones and the height and the path of these drones and uh, one needs to take licenses. I provided you a list of those authorities that must allow us to use these drones. And uh, at the moment, there are only few examples of deployment of drones. And uh, also when uh, uh, the passage of time, when uh, these become common, probably we, we will uh, have uh, uh, stricter regulations of to, in, in, in the areas that uh, drones can be used. And uh, while these drones, uh, they offer us uh, great pro prospects for vector surveillance, uh, but there are uh, limitations that we need to address and it requires capacity building, it requires advancement of technologies as these drones leave behind carbon footprints. I think we need drones that have, uh, you know, uh, very sophisticated batteries that can energize them so that they can cover uh, long distances rather than the petrol-based drones or uh, hydrocarbon-based drones. And uh, so we need to also understand the regulatory framework. And also uh, we need to train our manpower for the use of these new technologies and even the interpretation of data that is uh, transferred by these drones and uh, understanding of that requires a lot of uh, capacity building and also training of manpower. Uh, I thank uh, the Director General ICMR for this initiative and also thank Dr. Sumit Agarwal, uh, the scientist T and program manager for in the Division of Epidemiology for the use of drones. And of course, my colleague, Dr. Raju, who has actively helped me in assembling this uh, presentation for you. Thank you very much. Over. You are muted, Mansi. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kumar. It was an excellent presentation. Very exciting and uh, very good uh, 
uh, insight into how do we use drones into vector surveillance. Uh, I will uh, now uh, uh, ask a few questions alternatively to Dr. Pragya Yadav and to you. Uh, I'll, I'll start with uh, Dr. Yadav. Um, so ma'am, uh, 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 other than, you know, the high prevalent uh, vector bone diseases like, uh, like dengue, malaria, chikungunya, now CCHF that you have mentioned, what other diseases which we should be, you know, eyeing and what is the strategy, strategies of government of India for prevention? And what is the pre preparedness of the government to, you know, prevent such upcoming uh, viral diseases or upcoming vector bone diseases? So I, we would really like to know an insight from you on this. Uh, thank you, Mansi. So uh, as you said that India is known to have a high prevalence of several vector bone disease. Uh, due to its tropical and subtropical climate, as well as other factors such as population density, sanitation challenges, and inadequate healthcare infrastructure. And uh, if it, uh, a part of malaria, dengue, and chikungunya, we also have the Japanese encephalitis, Lismania, Phylodesi, and also the scuff typhus. These are some other challenges in India. And NVBCD only consider five diseases on the programs. Uh, so other diseases like CCHF, KFD, and uh, LIFA, they are not under uh, the vector bond program. But at the same time, if we follow uh, the classical guideline, which is being uh, which been released and work up time to time uh, from government of in India, that actually help in uh, these kind of approaches. So government of India has implemented several strategies as initiative to enhance preparedness and, and prevention of vector bond diseases and uh, the uh, and main one of the agencies national vector bond disease control program and we dcp is actually working on controlling preventing on vector bond disease like uh, not only malaria je dengue chikungunya kalajar and lymphatic phylosis but also uh, for the uh, for the lishmania 2223 is the uh, year of elimination and they have reached uh, this target very closely and hopefully we will at least could able to eradicate one of the vector borne disease. Uh, this include uh, the disease surveillance vector uh, control measures, diagnosis, treatment, capacity building and health education. There is also integrated vector management program which is government is trying to do that include indoor uh, residual spraying, use of insecticide treated bed nets, larvae uh, siding, environmental management, uh, personal protections, and also the community engagement, which was de uh, detailed uh, described by Dr. Ashwini Kumar recent, uh, immediately. So if uh, there is another factor of this control program, which include uh, the early warning system and government has established early warning system for vector bond disease to enable timely detection and response. The next is capacity building and training, and where we focus on uh, training on disease diagnosis, surveillance techniques, vector control methods, and effective communication for behavior change. Health education and community engagement is also a major factor for uh, this program, which include uh, the community engagement to raise awareness about vector borne disease and prevent uh, preventive measures. And in fact, I remember one of uh, uh, the story uh, of Dr. Uh, uh, he has made some very beautiful movies, how to educate the children on mosquitoes and for the vector control by Dr. Ashwini Kumar. So research and innovations is also uh, one of uh, the very important tool in this process. And in, in that we are trying to study the vector biology, pathogen genetics, drug resistance, vaccine development, and uh, vector control tools. The collaborations and partnership is the key to such programs and which include a national international organization that include WHO, CR member states, and different agencies who are working in this direction uh, use their recommendations, their roadmaps and guidelines and incorporate in uh, India Indian government's guideline. Recently in, in uh, March, there was a, a stakeholder meeting and uh, they are developing a roadmap for dengue uh, uh, control and also the vector uh, management program. So uh, government is trying to work on different these activities with the different stakeholders to strengthen vector bond disease preparedness and prevention. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Ashwini Kumar now. 
sir you mentioned about uh, there are there are ecological challenges but drones can help you you know overcome those ecological challenges and geographical conditions also for vector surveillance but when you propose these uh, you know uh, studies uh, to the, you uh, in, into the government systems and how how is the how are you how do you tackle the ethical regulations or the questions which come for ethical consideration safety issues with drones and currently practically how do we go forward if, if suppose we go to an area which is you know having a lot of rainfall or going to a so in such in such situations how do you you know how do you propose such studies uh practically uh, to be considered for for you know uh, implementation thank you manse uh, this is a very uh, loaded question i would say you have many in one uh, first of all uh, as i mentioned uh, there are ethical considerations here of course there are ethical concerns also the drones uh, they have they are they are laden with cameras right and uh, they some can be very high resolution cameras they can even peep through your windows and when they are uh, deployed in urban situations and uh, people are can be very sensitive about the movement of these aerial vehicles because unless they know the purpose of these vehicles they would suspect okay so therefore there is has to be a very strong element of involvement of uh, local leaders uh, local authorities and communities they should be made aware through media nowadays you know this uh, uh, whatsapp and all kinds of uh, social media they can be very well used uh, to leverage uh, you know they they can be leveraged uh, to inform the communities very quickly of course these are early days for drones and uh, we are still uh, working on uh, i mean there's it's just starting actually we need to understand the the strength of this technology uh, over the existing methods and how does it empower us uh, in the real sense of the word then the government uh, you know the program adopts uh, the methods when they are validated they are proven and then they bring in uh, you know some value to, uh, to the existing program measures that are taken so uh, so therefore these uh, are in the r and d space at this moment they are they have not been deployed so uh, more and more we have uh, actually vcrc has proposed a study uh, with the dr sumit agarwal who who my acknowledge that we will be undertaking a, a project wherein we will answer some of these questions we understand that there will be difficulties but then there will be uh, we can do cost comparison we can do comparison with the with the existing methods uh, so uh, and what value these drones bring and what challenges they bring when we deploy them so uh, so we understand that they, it won't be that easy but knowing the uh, the advantages that the drones bring in i think we need to introduce the newer and newer tools into the into the uh, vector space because this really gives us advantage of uh, say for example covering a large area of a city uh, you know in a short period of time which will be physically very difficult to cover in several months and the time to deploy your or uh, employ your uh, uh, measures can be very limited so if there is an outbreak for example and you need to 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 mount a rapid response so in this situation these drones can be very helpful of course when the conditions environmental conditions are very challenging as i mentioned to you rain uh, frost or over cover uh, uh, skies uh, you know uh, clouded uh, we, of course there will be limitations there will be limitations so uh, but these conditions uh, you know clear up after uh, some time and then you can deploy these technologies in the conditions that are suitable so uh, that's all i have to say uh, about uh, the question that you have posed okay 
the second question is uh, for dr pragya is uh, ma'am uh, you mentioned that there are no targeted therapies for cchs right there is no targeted viral therapy so is drug repurposing being considered for the effective treatment of cchs and uh, a follow up question uh, on the surveillance part is how do you think that uh, genomic surveillance and molecular surveillance would help in you know understanding the prevalence and load of cchs thank you bansi uh, uh, very relevant question so the drug re uh, for the cchf drug repurposing has been tried and one of the top drug is rivavirin and i was showing a table that what other drug has been used but unfortunately there is no clear cut evidence that if you give the drug uh, that it definitely help in reaction the virus the second problem is that when the patient arrive to you any antiviral therapy only work if it is given in a very early phase of the infection so most of the time because of the overlapping symptoms the cases arrive late in hospital third and most important this disease is called neglected tropical disease so it is happening in most of those countries where they are uh, prior to covid now every where country has enhanced uh, actually in, in not only the infrastructure but in the laboratory screening for a uh, purpose so i think we should have a better response but it is a high risk group of pathogen and that also add the complication of taking samples to a bsl2 uh, facility for so these are the certain challenges uh, which uh, unfortunately in india now we have a more number than any uh, in the past uh, bsl3 laboratories is growing in country and we have more capacity but uh, th there will be still challenge because all the surrounding geographical area is having this hot spot and uh, any infected pa patient can come to india and cause a transmission as well so that is one regarding the molecular uh, uh, surveillance how to uh, use that we have seen in pandemic how useful become uh, the testing of either is a c ways which dr rakesh was also telling but not only that but you also testing at hospital with different variant of concerns and uh, the uh, genomic sequencing become a kind of very simplest tool uh, to monitor the virus but if we talk about the vector borne diseases uh, we we are also talking here eradications control programs and many time it also uh, lead to the drug resistance or lead to uh, to uh, these mosquito become resistance to many other thing which can affect even the control programs so uh, these molecular tools not only can help in pathogen detection but if there is a changes in those pathogens or there is a mutation we can modify quickly these tools we can sequence it and we can use but also we can identify if there is a new species or vector has introduced in the in the community or they are causing such infections we can do the drug resistance monitoring uh, surely we can do the genetic diversity and understand the evolution if there is a new uh, pathogen or a mutated pathogen enter in 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 the ecosystem surely it help in outbreak investigation epidemiological study and by all these mean it actually help to the vector control monitoring especially those disease which is under the eradication program for example i was telling you leishmania so when we put lot of pressure on the control program there is a tendency that pathogen uh, may go under the mutations so that in during that phase the monitoring and sequencing would be really helpful to understand what is happening to the pathogen thank you thank you ma'am that was quite elaborate and uh, the second question the second question to dr ashwini kumar is uh, so given the socio economic disparity in india right uh, not just drone based vector surveillance uh, with what how do you see the road map uh, for vector borne disease prevention and control and treatment uh, with ai you know coming up uh, so fast and uh, gis being in uh, gis and all these technologies coming in how do you see how do you uh, you know foresee the future for surveillance of vector borne diseases yeah so uh, a very important question actually so uh, you know initially when this technology will be say hypothetically deployed in uh, uh, in the program setting it could be from the uh, you know from uh, the urban areas and peri urban areas and uh, you know these uh, because uh, here you have the large density of populations 
and you have several uh, in, uh, vector-borne diseases that are actually uh, transmitted in urban areas, especially dengue. Of course, dengue has moved to rural areas as well, but urban and peri-urban areas, dengue is, is a major, major problem emerging. Malaria has threat has gone down. So if you uh, look at the scale, actually, uh, dengue management is of primary concern. And in, in the dense populations, dense areas, you would find that small uh, container habitats where Aedes mosquito would prefer to breed. These are the areas which require active surveillance. And uh, we, we have small towns, we have medium-sized uh, towns, we have cosmo, you know, this metropolitan cities, very large towns. So, uh, so, so sector-wise surveillance and uh, or the ward-wise surveillance would uh, help in uh, uh, geographical recognizance, situational analysis, and uh, we can make use of these to start with. And then as we uh, build capacities, because program, if you want to deploy it, say in the, in the municipal corporations or the national program, in the primary health care system, you require, uh, you know, capacities, as Dr. Uh, uh, Pragya was mentioning. You need to build capacities. You need to, uh, you know, have uh, resources to buy these, uh, you know, vehicles, the aerial vehicles. You need to have trained manpower, which knows how to use it, operate it. And you need the stakeholders coming together in deployment of this technology. So, and uh, we also need, as I said, you know, these are early days, these drones uh, are advancing. This technology is also advancing very fast. So we need the drones which can carry larger payload to a longer distances and can uh, help us in, uh, you know, managing uh, large areas in short time. So, uh, so for surveillance, it is one thing, and for physical removal of breeding sites, drones are not going to do source reduction for you. They will empower you for act, taking action in particular areas. So the real-time information that is provided to you, if 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 uh, the uh, this information can be uh, used efficiently and very quickly, you can dispose of uh, say the unwanted breeding habitats. Uh, from the area where uh, you have the, uh, you know, outbreak, signs of outbreak, so that, you know, you prevent it from becoming a larger outbreak or an epidemic. So initially, I would say that you have to use it with a great sense of caution. We need a lot of experience in this. We need to understand what will be the response and reaction of the communities. We have to also be mindful of the data safety because this data is actually uh, is a, a geographical kind of information that you are having for a particular geographical area. It should not fall in the wrong hands. And this data can be misused also. And we, we understand the drones have also been used for peddling the narcotics. And across uh, the border, you know, from the neighboring country, we find that our security forces shoot uh, uh, many drones, you know, which carry the payload with the drugs and other thing, narcotics. So for similar activities, uh, the drones can also be used by the elements taking the, ma making the, uh, you know, uh, excuse of these drones. We, we may think that these are deployed by our, uh, our programs and for good purposes. So there are several issues here. I would say that, you know, this has to mature up. We are still uh, in early days, and also they leave footprint, print carbon footprint. And as I mentioned to you, that we need now sophisticated technologies, uh, maybe high-powered lithium batteries that can run these drones for a longer period of time, and uh, would that at the same time they would not leave the carbon footprint also. Okay, so uh, this is what I have to say about the yeah. question. Yeah, that's that's great, sir. Thank you so much. This is the end of my questions to both Dr. Yadav and Dr. Kumar. I would now hand over uh, the, uh, the session to Dr. Mishra for closing remarks. Thank you. Sir, you are muted, sir.
usual problem uh, yeah, again so thank you manasi for the conducting the uh, webinar so nicely and uh, thank you uh, to both uh, dr pragya yadav and dr ashwini kumar for bringing in uh, uh, unique perspectives of uh, uh, vector surveillance as we see that uh, even if we don't know some disease uh, that is that common you know, like uh, cchf but these are the emerging diseases and one day they can take a dimension uh, which we can become a big problem uh, so therefore it is extremely important to uh, keep an eye so that we are prepared and we are uh, monitoring uh, and we can foresee and therefore preempt uh, disasters that can happen so surveillance is not only important for pandemic or very common disease but also for emerging they can be even more uh, dangerous and we should keep trying for various ways of finding interventions and cures and so on so uh, we learned uh, from her very elegant presentation uh, various aspects of how uh, great work uh, they are doing and we also had a very interesting uh, view of uh, surveillance using modern technology of uh, drones so uh, and if you combine the drone technology that means you can reach the places which you cannot walk or you cannot uh, easily land uh, in person but you can reach uh, make your uh, reach up to there using the drones and once they are fitted with high resolution camera and uh, even uh, other kind of sampling and delivery and of course it keep, uh, combine that with machine learning and ai i think we are looking at the future of uh, 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 ai driven surveillance uh, which can give us uh, uh, information which we can then make use of. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kumar, for bringing up uh, uh, those uh, uh, points. And I'm sure India is full of innovators, young innovators who will uh, 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 get interested and uh, bring up uh, more and more innovations, which will help uh, the, the life sciences and or the molecular biology approaches to reach where it cannot reach otherwise. So uh, that has been wonderful. And uh, uh, what I feel now after listening to these presentation is that the science with humanitarian approach will ensure availability of uh, means to tackle existing and uh, uh, emerging pathogens. And in the meantime, uh, we hope that uh, we will have more interactions and networking with both of you. And also we will uh, keep increasing this uh, uh, activity of uh, talking to each other, networking, exchanging views, and uh, uh, finding efficient ways of uh, taking care of uh, uh, problems that may arise due to infections using the webinars uh, that the series that we uh, started and hope to continue with cooperation of all of you. I thank all the participants uh, for uh, 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 listening to this and asking questions and look forward to further interactions. Thank you all and all the best. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you all.